seriously popular. In today's episode of The Trial of Lucy Letby, Baby K, we bring you what was said to the jury as they retire to consider their verdict. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome to episode six, You Decide. Okay, you can do this. I know, I know. Carvana makes it so convenient to sell your car. It's just hard to let go. My car and I have been through so much together. But look, you already have a great offer from Carvana. That was fast. Well, I know my license plate and VIN by heart, and those questions were easy. You're almost there. Now to just accept the offer and schedule a pickup or drop-off. How'd you do it? How are you so strong in letting go of your car? Well, I already made up my mind, and Carvana's so easy. Oh, uh, yeah, true. And sold. Go to Carvana.com to sell your car the convenient way. Did I hear you're shopping for a car? Because I've been at it for ages. Ugh, such a time suck, right? Not really. I bought it on Carvana. Super convenient. Oh, then comes all the financing, research. Am I right? Well, you can. But I got pre-qualified for a Carvana auto loan in like two minutes. Yeah, but then all the number crunching and terms, right? Nope. I saw real numbers as I shopped, found my dream car, and got it in a couple of days. Wait, like you already have it? Yep. Oh. Go to Carvana.com to finance your car the convenient way. Lucy a nurse trusted the with the lives of newborn babies. Has been found guilty of killing Today, seven newborn guilty. children and attempting to murder six more. Retrial on a charge the last jury couldn't reach a verdict on. Lucy Letby is a child killer. Last year, she was convicted of murdering seven babies and trying to murder six more when she was working as a neonatal nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England. She was sentenced to spend her life in jail. She's now back in court to face a retrial on one charge the jury could not reach a verdict on. The alleged attempted murder of a premature baby girl known as Baby K. In this podcast, we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby, Baby K. So today, as this trial comes to an end, we'll bring you the moment the jury were told that Lucy Letby's guilt or innocence is now in their hands. They were told by the judge they should put any feelings of sympathy, empathy or antipathy out of their heads. They were told by the prosecution that Lucy Letby is cunning, devious and sly. They were told by the defence that the case against her was incredible, ridiculous and deeply unfair. And they were told their decision still came down to whether they believed the star witness, Dr Ravi Jayram. Right, so last week, after Lucy Letby finished giving her evidence, the defence closed its case, which means the jury effectively heard all the evidence. And what they've now heard are the final closing speeches of the defence and the prosecution barristers. Plus, they've also been given some legal direction from the judge. So Mr Justice Goss began by reminding them of the charge, that Lucy Letby is accused of attempting to murder baby Kay by deliberately interfering with her breathing tube hours after she was born. He also reminded them that she denies the charge and says she has no recollection of the event or of being in the nursery at that time. He also reminded the jury that Lucy Letby has previously been convicted of a number of offences and he said it was a natural instinct to feel horror about someone harming a child. But he said they must not come to this case with any preconceptions. He told them if there were inconsistencies in the evidence or in what witnesses had told them, it was up to them to decide who you find truthful and who you do not. So Nick Johnson Casey, who prosecutes the case, got to his feet to address the jury and he began like this. Lucy Letby is an extraordinary person. And he added... Not in a good way. He told them she'd murdered seven children and she'd attempted to murder six more children, crimes she was found guilty of in August last year. He then read down what he called the terrible list of the names of the babies she'd killed or tried to kill and their ages. Many of them, he said, were just days old. She has murdered seven children. Baby A, murdered on the day he was born. Baby C, murdered when he was four days old. Baby D murdered at two days of age. 
Baby E, he was six days old. Baby I was about 11 weeks old. Baby O, two days old. And the very next day, his brother, Baby P, three days old. Murdered all by Lucy Letby. I have not forgotten Baby B, Baby A's twin, Baby F, Baby E's twin, Baby G, the twins, Baby L and M, or Baby N, who she also tried to murder. Thirteen separate children. You now have to consider whether she also tried to murder Baby K. He said Lucy Letby was cunning and devious when she carried out what he called her campaign of murder in the nurseries of the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, and he said her previous convictions were entirely relevant to the case before them now. The crimes themselves are wholly abnormal, but so too are the circumstances in which they were committed. From the first murder to the last was one year, two weeks and three days. So cunning and devious was Lucy Letby that she managed to commit her campaign of murder and attempted murder undetected for all those months. We say that tells you an awful lot about her as a person, how devious she is, and we say you should take that into account when considering the evidence in this case. He told the jury that Baby K was the epitome of fragility. She weighed, he said, 692 grams, the equivalent of seven-tenths of a bag of sugar. She was so fragile, so tiny, that her birth was a source of great interest on the unit, which didn't usually care for such premature babies. He said Baby K was not only of great interest to other staff on the unit, but most importantly, she was of great interest to Lucy Letby. You might want to take that into account when you assess what Lucy Letby tells you now that she doesn't really remember very much. She made it her business to get involved in her care, he said. But when she was asked in the witness box about the allegations from Dr Ravi Jayram, who claimed he caught her virtually red-handed harming baby Kay, she said she couldn't recall the incident or even being in the nursery. But she said it couldn't be true because it's not the sort of thing that I would do. Context, context, context. It's why context is so important, isn't it? It's why, without the remotest hint of irony, on nine separate occasions in her evidence, in an effort to give emphasis to her testimony, Lucy Letby referred to best practice, normal practice, or common practice. There was nothing best or normal about Lucy Letby's practice, but it was, you may think, as was proved by her convictions, common practice for her to sabotage infants that were entrusted into her care, and that's the context of the decision you have to make. He said Lucy Letby's defence team had thrown red herrings into the case, claims that the Countess of Chester Hospital should never have been caring for baby Kay in the first place because she was so premature and claims she'd received suboptimal care had been made to distract the jury. Throwing the mud of incompetence at the doctors in the hope that some of it would stick. But he said the standard of care at the hospital had nothing to do with why baby Kay's breathing tube was moved. He also pointed out that nature had determined when and where baby Kay had been born after her mother went into labour and was admitted to the Countess at just under 25 weeks pregnant. And you'll remember that she had to be kept at the Countess because the nearest specialist bed was miles away in Preston. Mr Johnson said the alternative prospect was baby Kay being born feet first in the back of an ambulance on a motorway. He said the evidence of nursing consultant Elizabeth Morgan had been clear. If a baby as premature as baby Kay was desaturating, best practice would be to do something, either call for help so further checks could be made or increase the oxygen supply to the baby. And you'll remember this is in relation to Lucy Letby telling police in her interviews that she may have been waiting for baby Kay to self-correct when her oxygen levels started to drop, which is why Dr Jayram accused her of doing nothing when he came into the nursery. In her evidence to the court, Lucy Letby insisted it was normal practice at the Countess to give babies time to self-correct. But Mr Johnson reminded the jury what Mrs Morgan had told them. I do not believe that it would be normal nursing practice to wait and see if the baby self-corrects at this age. He said one thing which was not reasonable was doing nothing, and he told the jury the very evidence the defence relied on to prove the hospital had provided suboptimal care to baby Kay were Lucy Letby's own actions. 
You are faced with this proposition, we suggest, that in seeking to distract you from who moved the tube and deploying evidence of suboptimal care, the defence are relying on the incidents that this defendant brought about to destabilise baby K. So they're relying on the defendant's acts of sabotage to undermine, in your eyes, the competence of the staff at the Countess of Chester Hospital. He told them, Keep your eye on the ball. And then he said, the events that define Baby K's time at the Countess of Chester Hospital are best described as criminal, not suboptimal. They are criminal because the ill fortune that befell Baby K was the result of deliberate acts by Lucy Letby. And he added that maybe with hindsight, Baby K and her mum should have been shipped out of the Countess because there was a murderer working on the neonatal unit. Mr Johnson said Lucy Letby had been based in nursery two on the night that baby K was born and she wanted to be involved in her care in nursery one. But he said she didn't want the records to show it and he reminded the jury of some of the medical notes they'd been shown during the trial, specifically where she'd not signed the nursing charts. Lucy Letby was very keen to get her hands on baby K, but she wanted to reduce the audit trail. She wanted to reduce the number of documents that could be attributed to her in the lead up to what she knew was going to happen. He said Lucy Letby said this was a simple oversight, but he pointed out that she'd also altered other records to create the impression she was somewhere else, looking after and feeding different babies when she was trying to murder baby K. Do you remember me saying how sly she is? How calculating and devious? That's the person you are dealing with, ladies and gentlemen. It was also clear, he said, from the evidence from Baby K's designated nurse, Joanne Williams, that she'd only left Baby K when she was stable. Mr Johnson said door swipe data from her hospital pass and notes recorded by the transport team who were coming to transfer Baby K suggested Nurse Williams had been off the unit for as little as six minutes when she went to update her parents on her condition. In that time, Dr Jayram had become concerned and gone into the nursery. Dr Jayram told you who that person was, didn't he? It was Lucy Letby. Dr Jayram wanted to check, and you know what he found. He reminded the jury that Dr Jayram had told them the alarms on baby K's cot were not sounding when he walked into the nursery, even though her oxygen levels were dropping into the low 80s. But when Nurse Williams came back a few minutes later, she'd said the alarms were sounding. He said this was because the alarm had been muted for one minute. And he said it had just been bad luck for Lucy Letby that Dr Jayram had walked in. Then, in a dramatic moment in his speech, Mr Johnson counted slowly to 30 to demonstrate to the jury the length of time that Baby K's tube must have been dislodged for before her oxygen levels began to drop. He told them... That had happened before Dr Jairam went into the room. It's about context and why it is so important. This is why we say you know what she's done to other children, because who but a murderer would do that to a child like this? When Dr. Jeram entered Nursery One, Lucy Letby was standing there doing nothing, watching this fragile child deteriorate. All it would have taken was one simple turn of the dial on the oxygen. The fact that Lucy Letby didn't even do that, didn't call for help, even though she must have known that Dr. Jeram was at the nurse's station, is clear evidence from which you can infer the reason baby KD saturated was because of Lucy Letby. He then said her evidence in the witness box had been an extraordinary performance. He said she'd tiptoed through the minefield of what she'd said in her police interviews and now claims she only accepted she'd been in Nursery One to be helpful and answer their questions. This devious murderer was trying to be helpful. But he said she couldn't say exactly who it was she'd been trying to help. With all the skill of a politician, she tried to avoid the question. And Mr Johnson questioned why Dr Jayram would make it all up. Is it being suggested that there is some effort to cover up an uncomfortable stitch-up of Lucy Letby? That's not credible, is it? What has he got to gain? So then Mr Johnson turned to the Facebook searches the jury's been told Lucy Letby had been carrying out. He said she'd only crossed paths with Baby Kay and her parents for around five and a half hours. She didn't even know their full names, he said. But two years, two months and two hours later, she searched Facebook for their surname. Why were they so memorable, he asked. The answer can only be because she tried to kill Baby Kay. 
The truth is, Lucy Letby had a fascination with babies she had murdered and attempted to murder and with their families. She took pleasure in her murderous handiwork. Mr Johnson said that 11 weeks after she made the Facebook search, Lucy Letby was arrested and interviewed by the police for the first time. He said it wasn't credible she'd forgotten about Baby K over that period. And he concluded... When you look at the whole picture, it is clearly established that Dr Jairam is telling the truth. And if you agree with that, then we respectfully submit that the only proper verdict on this single count of the indictment is one of guilty. We'll take a quick break there. So next, it was the turn of Ben Myers KC to address the jury, and he began by telling them they were not spectators at this trial, and it was up to them and them alone to decide whether Lucy Letby is guilty or not. He said anyone who thinks this case is a done deal is wrong, and that it's their job, the jury, to assess the evidence and decide what's credible and what's incredible. And he got straight to the point. I will suggest to you what is incredible. That's the evidence of Dr. Jairam, which sits right at the heart of this case. It's fair to disagree with me, but I'm going to suggest it's incredible, isn't it? Isn't it? He reminded the six women and six men on the jury that in his opening address, Mr. Johnson had told them the case might come down to whether they believed Dr. Jairam was telling the truth or not. You remember what the prosecution said about how Lucy Letby was caught virtually red-handed by Dr. Jairam. Really? Really? If what Dr. Jairam says is true, what would you do? What would you do? You would tell the management. And if they dragged their heels, you would tell the police. It's not rocket science. Dr. Jairam said, we didn't have the training. Utterly ridiculous. You are expected to swallow that from him and the prosecution. Pathetic. A child would know what to do. If Dr. Jairam saw what he claims he saw and really thought what he claims he thought, he would have called the police and got her out. The only sensible reason for him not doing that is because events were not as he said they were. Lucy Letby became tearful in the dock as Mr Myers said that he and his junior barrister Fiona Clancy were the only ones prepared to stand up for her. Miss Clancy and I are here to defend Lucy Letby and that is what we will do, standing up for her when no one else is going to do that. For this to be a fair trial and for there to be a fair outcome on the evidence, that comes down to you, ladies and gentlemen. It is you who decides. We say the medical evidence and general circumstances to this allegation do not get us close to be sure of Lucy Letby's guilt. Mr Myers said if it wasn't for Lucy Letby's previous convictions, nobody would entertain that she was guilty. While Dr Jram's evidence was central to the case, he said, it was ridiculous and unbelievable. Dr Jram's evidence is, we say, an insult to the collective intelligence of everyone in this courtroom, to say he saw what he says he saw, and thought what he says he thought, and to do absolutely nothing, we say it's ridiculous, and it's unbelievable. He reminded the jury about how Mr Johnson had asked Lucy Letby if she was responsible for a broken catheter on another baby, who'd pulled out his own breathing tube the night before Baby K was allegedly attacked, and he said the prosecution thought they could say what they liked and make allegations without any evidence because of her previous convictions. This investigation has been running for six years. There is nothing in this case to support that, and it was unfair and deeply prejudicial. It is extraordinary, but demonstrates how an allegation can be made out of just about anything. And he urged the jury not to use her convictions as a shortcut to finding her guilty. Please do not use those convictions to beef up a fundamentally weak case. Different standards were being applied to her compared to the other doctors and nurses on the unit, Mr Myers said. He pointed to mistakes made by other nurses and Dr Jairam in the medical notes, which he said were accepted as human error or lapses in their memory, whereas in his client's case they were used to suggest she was being devious or selective in her recall to avoid answering difficult questions. Mr Myers said the prosecution had played games with her police interviews to suggest she changed her story about being in the nursery when baby Kate collapsed. But he said there was no mystery and she'd always told them she didn't remember what happened that night. 
He also said searching on Facebook didn't make her guilty because she'd searched for all sorts of people on social media. And he said the prosecution's theory that she may have searched for Baby Kay's surname because Nurse Williams had been interviewed by the police a few weeks before, which had filtered back to her was a possible explanation, even though Lucy Letby herself couldn't remember why she'd done it. Mr Myers also suggested that Baby Kay was clinically fragile and should never have been born at the Countess. Baby Kay was a very unwell and very fragile baby right from the start. She wasn't in an appropriate unit for her. She wasn't, that's a fact. However, that came to happen and we say she didn't get the expert care she needed. What happened with her desaturation was consistent with her condition and the care she got, or didn't. That blame is then shunted Miss Letby's way. There's nothing stable about a baby like Baby K. She's very close to the margins of viability. I'm not being insensitive. I understand how emotive this is. But she was an incredibly fragile and unwell baby. He reminded the jury of Baby K's problems, her prematurity, her severe lung disease, her low blood pressure, her struggle to maintain her oxygen levels, her blood clotting issues, blood sugar and kidney problems. He also reminded them of the review carried out after her death by an expert neonatologist, which said she'd received grade two suboptimal care at the Countess. That wasn't a fantasy dreamt up by the defence, he said. It was the conclusion of the experts at Arrow Park Hospital. He said Baby K didn't get the medicine to lubricate her lungs quickly enough and he also reminded the jury about the delay in her receiving antibiotics, having a catheter inserted in her umbilical cord, the air leak around the breathing tube and the bloodstained secretions noted down by Nurse Williams. Mr Myers said drops in oxygen were not surprising given Baby K's condition. Several nurses had told the jury breathing tubes could slip in neonates or they could dislodge them themselves. He also reminded the jury of a note made by the transport team who transferred Baby K to Arrow Park, which said she was ventilated, but the tube was not very secure and the ties had to be tightened. Finally, Mr Myers returned to Dr Jayram. He said the allegation stands or falls on whether the jury believe he's telling the truth. He said the main reasons they were here was because of his vivid and powerful description of what he said he saw that night. And then he played them a video of an interview Dr Jayram gave to ITN last year to remind them how he said the night Baby K collapsed was etched on his memory and in his nightmares forever. But Mr Myers accused Dr Jayram of wriggling around in his evidence. If a neonate wriggles around as much as Dr Jayram did in his evidence, there's no wonder tubes become dislodged. What do you do in that situation? It's simple. You call the police and get management involved. You get her out of there, there and then. Pathetic blustering about management. We have different systems. Really? Someone is killing babies on your unit and you are worried about management. If there were problems with management, this was the moment. Never mind suspicions or reviews. I've caught her red-handed, deliberately dislodging a breathing tube. It's giving me nightmares that are etched in eternity. You would do something. But between February 2016 and June 2016, Dr. Jayram did nothing. Nothing. How on earth could he not have gone to managers and said what he had seen, if there's any truth in it? That's frankly incredible. Mr Myers said Dr Jayram had a series of lame excuses for why he hadn't contacted the police. But in reality, he didn't act because there was nothing for him to act upon. It's unbelievable for a man who has had so much to say for himself in this courtroom and on TV. Unbelievable. He remained silent for four months. How could he leave Miss Letby on the unit without saying anything to anybody, including her, if he had really seen what he had claimed to have seen? If he saw what he says he saw, we say, of course, he would have escalated it, or called the police, or done something. What makes more sense is he didn't see anything that led him to believe the tube had been dislodged. That's why he did nothing, and said nothing. It's as simple as that. Mr Myers concluded by saying there is no way on the evidence they'd heard that they would be here trying this case if Lucy Letby had not been convicted of other offences in August last year. We say you have good reason not to be sure of this allegation. And whatever Miss Letby has been convicted of elsewhere, the safe and proper verdict on this count is not guilty. That's the verdict we ask you to return. So that's it. We're expecting the jury to be sent out today to start considering their verdict. Lucy Letby denies the charge of attempted murder. 
and we'll of course be back with another episode as soon as they've made their decision. And another quick reminder for anyone who's been listening to episodes of this podcast from the previous trial, we've had to take those down for the duration of this trial for legal reasons. You can read my reports in the mail and follow us on X at The Trial Podcast or contact us on the trial at mailmetromedia.co.uk. You can leave a comment on Spotify or send us a voice note on WhatsApp on 07796 657 512. Start your message with the word trial. See you then.